Dave Petromala is widely regarded as the greatest player in Johns Hopkins history. In 2015, he also became the program's winningest coach ever. Today, we take a closer look at Dave Petromala, the player, the coach, and the person. You know, you're the first person in lacrosse history to win a national title as a player in 1987, two as a coach, 2005, 2007. Take me back to your playing days and describe who Dave Petromal, the player, was. Certainly a guy that was, would be difficult to coach for me. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I guess it's one of those things where, as a coach, it's do as I say, not as I do, or in this case, not as I did. Um, I was a challenge to coach, um, and not, not for the reasons you might think. I was a, I loved to practice, I loved to play. Um, I was competitive, I, I mean, I loved playing lacrosse, so that was never the issue. Um, it was my focus off the field, um, my focus in the classroom, my commitment to doing all the right things. And uh, I was a young guy. Um, I made some mistakes. Uh, you know, they are, they, are, they are what has made me who I am today. Um, but I was a different guy then. I'm no different a competitor now. Maybe if so, if not more competitive now. I would love to coach a guy like me that had that competitive edge and loved to practice. So I might struggle with some of the other parts right now. In 1989, the national title game, a lot of people say Syracuse versus Johns Hopkins in that title tilt, the best game in a championship venue ever. You're known through the circles as the best defender ever. You played against the best offensive player ever in Gary Gate. Take me through your mindset on that championship day. Oh, I got to play against the best player ever, in my opinion. He's not the best offensive player. He's the best player ever. And that guy has done things to change our game. Um, and he was, uh, he was a bear to cover. You know, I've had, you know, plenty of people tell me that that game inspired them to play the, to, to play the game or play the sport. And when I watched that game myself, you can't help but sit there and say, wow. You look at the players that were on the field and how many first-team All-Americans there were. When you think about, you know, Matt Panetta at the attack and uh, Greg Burns and John Zilberti and Tom Marachek, Quint Kesnick, you know, that's a who's who of, of lacrosse back then. And they're guys that helped change the game. Um, and so it was a very exciting game. Uh, obviously, a tremendous disappointment with, you know, your career ending on that note um, but it was uh, you know it was an exciting game to be a part of uh, it was kind of everything I had ever dreamed of uh, it had pageantry it had a huge crowd I'll never forget walking out I was uh, elected a game captain uh, and to this day my greatest regret as a player is I was not a captain here at Johns Hopkins and nor did I deserve to be um, for the reasons I stated earlier which was you know I was challenging to coach a little bit um, but I went out as a game captain with Brendan Kelly and Joe Resenpollock, and I'll never forget the three of us walking down the stairs at the old Bird Stadium, and the crowd uh, was, at the time, you know, to all of us, it was monstrous. And we went out and uh, went out for the coin toss, and that game was, it was on from the second that whistle blew. And that game was on till the second, the last second of that game. And it was... Uh, for me, it was a chance to play against a great team, to, to compete against great players, to compete with guys that were my brothers. Um, you know, and I don't, uh, you know, I'm not a guy that is very uh, reflective sometimes. You know, I'm a put my nose down and, and go forward. But I do catch myself reflecting about those moments sometimes. And, uh, you know, that's as big as it got for lacrosse at that point. And I think that was a real turning point for our sport. And to think that we all were a part of that is, uh, is pretty unbelievable. You're not giving yourself the credit that you deserve. Why were you such a great player? 
Uh, you know, listen, I'm not here to tell you I was a great player. That's for other people. I'm telling that, you. Well, thank you. That's for other people to decide. Um, you know, I, I, I know what I know. I, I know what I need to know about myself. And that's really what mattered. And I know what my teammates thought of me. That's really what mattered to me was, you know, was I, could I be counted on for my teammates? And uh, I loved, I told you, I love to play. I love to compete. I wanted to be the best. I came to Johns Hopkins to be a national champion, a first-team All-American, the defenseman of the year, and the player of the year. And God's honest truth, I came here for that. And those were my goals. Um, so I had the good fortune to play for great coaches and play with teammates that let me do what I was good at. And when I screwed it up, they were there to bail me out. So. You know, I guess the, the answer to the question is I had a good career because I had great coaches and I had great teammates. You mentioned your mindset as a player, and we know that you're different as a coach. Why? It's a different responsibility. Uh, I mean, being a coach is like being a parent. I mean, it's a great, in my opinion, it's a grave responsibility. You know, my job, I'm charged with helping these young men become the best version of themselves that they can be. Um, my staff and, and our job, you know, yeah, it's to win. Um, but aside from that, it's, it's to help these young men develop their character, to develop their work ethic, to develop the skills they need to be successful. You know, that's a pretty great responsibility is to help these young guys prepare for life. And these are really formidable years for them, you know, and it's, it's one of my struggles is I am very demanding of them, yet I, I, I love every one of them. Yeah, I want to win. I hate to lose. But if a kid, if a young guy doesn't become what he's capable of, then I failed. Winning is really important to us. And living up to the expectations of the Johns Hopkins standard and the tradition is crucial to me. But at the end of the day, though helping those young men become the men they're supposed to be is the most important thing for me. You just used the word tradition and excellence. And when you think of Notre Dame football, lacrosse's version, oftentimes people say Johns Hopkins. What is it like coaching here? It's the best job in America. I mean, everybody always says, wow, you know, there's so much pressure there. And, you know, the alumni, I'll be honest with you, the alums have been great. And, you know, if I'm not doing my job and they ask me to leave, then I guess it's time for me to go. We've got great alums. Why would you want to be somewhere where they don't care? Our alums care. They're interested. They're invested. We have some people that are passionate about Hopkins lacrosse. How is that a bad thing? You know, sure they have opinions. I'd rather, I'd rather them have an opinion on what we should be doing on offense and defense than have someone ask them, say, well, what's the lacrosse team at Hopkins doing? And they look at you and go, oh, we have a lacrosse team? I mean, come on. There, there, there's positives and negatives to every, everything, and the, and the positives far outweigh the negatives. We have an administration that's committed to this program. I mean, look at this facility that we're sitting in. It's a $10 million facility that no one has. And I'm sure there will be more to come, but we set the standard. And it was from the generous donations of our passionate alums. I'm blessed to, to have this job. And uh, I, I, I always wanted to be a part of something bigger than me and greater than me. And that's one of the reasons why I chose to come to Hopkins as a player. Well, I certainly, I'm a part of something that's bigger than me and greater than me than, and we all are, all of us that are a part of it, um, to have that opportunity to be a part of something like that as the coach is, is, is spectacular. Outside of the bricks and mortar, you go back to 2001, your first year as a head coach here. It's now 2015. How has the job changed? Um, like anything else, you have to try to reinvent yourself and, uh, I would tell you, it's, I mean, this year is different on so many, um, on so many levels. You know, I've, we're dealing with a, tra a tragedy in the passing of one of, all, one of our players. And I can't describe to you the, 
the sadness that I feel and uh, the challenge that it's been for not just me, but for all of us to deal with. Um, when I first got here, it was more about the X's and O's, and now it's more about the other stuff. It's more about, you know, relationships. It's more about making sure you're taking care of the players. It's more about, I don't know how some of these guys that have been coaching for like 30 years, I can't imagine how different it is. I mean, we recruit freshmen now. Yeah. When I came here, we had like 30 visits for senior recruits, 30 official visits. You know, we only do official visits for our incoming freshmen now. It, it's changed on every level. It's more competitive. There's more parity. There's greater responsibility to the administration for the behavior of the players, which I, I, I think we are responsible for these guys. There's greater responsibility on a player's plate for their, you know, for their, uh, you know, behavior and what they do academically and athletically. It's, it's much, it's a sport that is now far more in the limelight. Before, we were a small time sport that no one really cared what went on and you could do, things happened and you moved on. And now something happens, it's national news. So we have gotten exactly what we wanted. We're in a big time. And we're not even close to football and basketball, but we're big time enough where the things that transpire matter. I'm going to mention a few players' names that you've coached since 2001 at Johns Hopkins. Give me a few words to describe each one. Kyle Harrison. Kyle Harrison. Consummate professional. He was a professional before he was a professional lacrosse player. He was prepared. He was worldly. He understood there was a bigger picture here and he had a greater responsibility. He, he knew it was his job to train the next group of Hopkins lacrosse players and to set the standard. He saw that early on. He really was, he, he really, is a consummate professional. He sees the big picture. Paul Rabel. Like Kyle, a great player, but the first word that comes to mind with, with, with Paul is competitive. I remember when he got here as a freshman, uh, Paul was playing pickup basketball in the back gym and Kyle was on the other team and Paul said, I'm covering Kyle. As a freshman? As a freshman, Kyle was older. Yeah. And it was game to whatever, Kyle's team won, let's play again. Game to whatever, Kyle's team won again, let's play again. Game to whatever, Paul's team won, thanks, have a good day. <laughs> that was Paul. And Paul, Paul may be the most prepared guy that I've had the opportunity to coach. He is, uh, he, he was phenomenal. Speaking of uh, relationships, you've been seen at Patriot Games. Describe your relationship with uh, Bill Belichick. You know, it's, he's a friend. And, uh, and I do consider him a great friend. He's a confidant. Um, he's someone that I feel I can confide in and know that it doesn't go any further than his ears. Um, you know, obviously he's been just, you know, unbelievable to talk about the game of lacrosse with because he does have a knowledge of the game and a passion for it. Our conversations have just been uh, unbelievable from Dealing with the death of his player um, when they had it at uh, New England, to me talking to him now about how he dealt with that. You know, how to handle big wins, how to handle tough losses, different messages for the team. Um, I mean, we talk about it all. And, uh, you know, in my opinion, he's the, he's the greatest coach to coach in all sports. You know, and I have him as a resource and I have him as a friend. And I am sure at times to separate that. You know, everybody always asks, well, what's going on up in New England? And there are certain things I just don't ask. Uh, he's my friend. You know, I don't want him to think I'm asking because I want information. I'm friends with him because I enjoy him. I like him. And when we talk professionally, then it's very much between him and I and I don't share what he says, and he doesn't share. I think we're both very similar in that we're both, to a point, pretty private. You know, there are things, I mean, I'll do this stuff, and I can't tell you I enjoy doing this stuff. 
Because quite frankly, I don't. I'd rather you go interview someone else. And I'm sure he you feels... Like talking to me now? I like talking to you because I like you. And I know you and I'm comfortable with you. I don't necessarily feel that way about everybody. And I think coach is similar. I think we share that um, feeling that what goes on with our program is very private. And I've talked very openly with you about certain things, but there's things that I won't talk about. January 26th, tragedy hit this program. Jeremy Huber, freshman defenseman from the state of Nevada, passed away of natural causes. Describe that day. It was the worst day of my life. Um, it's hard to describe. Um, you know, we were, we sat there, I mean, it started like any other day. Um, Monday morning, our eight o'clock staff meeting, we sit down in the conference room. And literally at eight o'clock, my cell phone rings and it's one of our freshmen. And he says to me, coach, and I say his name. And I said, what's up? Not thinking much of anything, you know, at eight o'clock in the morning, it's not, you know, I, I'm not thinking there was a problem. I would have known if there was on Sunday. And he says, Coach Jeremy won't respond. I can't get him to respond. I said, what? And he said, he's not responding. I said, is he breathing? He says, Coach, he's cold. And he's got, you know, stuff around his mouth. Not, I mean, what's the first thing you think of? And literally, I grabbed my AD, and in four minutes, we were at the dorms. And it's a, it's a blur. You know, out of respect for Nancy, Bob, and, and, and Justin, you know, I, 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 I can't tell you what I said to her on the phone, because quite frankly, I don't remember. I don't know, I don't know how I made that phone call, but I got to tell you, I have no clue how she took it. And she's a far better person and stronger person than I am. It was just a terrible day. Um, we lost a young man who was a really good person. You know, and a lot of times when someone passes or something happens, people always talk nice about them. Everybody that talks about him means, you know, he was a great young man. In a short period of time, he touched a lot of lives. And, uh, you know, I brought him here. And I promised him we'd take care of him. And he passed away on my watch. That's a tough thing to swallow. Um, he was our freshman's friend. And to be quite frank with you, you know, that day, is, I mean, you asked me to describe it, I, I don't know if I can. And uh, it's been a, a challenging month. It's been the hardest year of my coaching career, and I'm sure of my staffs and our players. It's been perspective. Um, it's forced me at times to feel uncomfortable on the field, which is a place where I've never felt uncomfortable. I'm sure it's been the same for our players. You know, is it okay to go out and have fun and play and enjoy ourselves when this happened? Is it okay for me to push and be tough and demand when this happened? And I don't have a book for this. And my job is to have the answers. And you know me well enough to know I take it personally that I should have the answers. Without having the answers, it's been over a month, what's been the message to your team? You put one foot in front of the other. We're going to take it one minute, one hour, one day at a time. We're going to do it all together, and we're going to be there for one another. And we need to communicate with one another and share with each other how we're feeling. Um, and the, the other thing we've talked a lot about is choices. And this is a time in our life where we have a choice. And we have a choice. Are we going to move forward? And moving forward doesn't mean forgetting. It means remembering, but still living our lives like he would want us to and like we need to. It's important that they be happy. It's important that they still smile. It's important that they go out to a party and enjoy themselves. They deserve that. They, they, they have to do that. 
But I think at times we all feel like it's not okay to do that because if we do, we're being disrespectful to Jeremy's memory and Jeremy would not want that. So it's been a lot of trying to help them understand that it is okay to move forward and that everybody moves forward at a different pace. But we really together have to do that if we hope to do the things we set out to do. You move forward onto the field in 2015 as a member of the Big Ten. It's the first year of Big Ten lacrosse. It's the first time Hopkins has ever been part of a conference. You've been independent for all those years. What does joining the Big Ten mean to Johns Hopkins? 15 years ago when I took the job here, if you asked me would we ever be a part of a conference, I would tell you no, no way, and I would probably be a bit arrogant about it. We, take, we, we took so much pride in our independence. So did Syracuse. You know that. You were a part of that. As a program, sometimes you have to reinvent yourself. And given the lay of the, the land and the landscape of athletics and lacrosse and all this conference realignment, my job is to lead this program and always do what's in the best interest of the players and of the program. That comes before me and my staff. And what was in the best interest of this program moving forward and securing the future of this program. Joining a conference was the most important thing we could do. How can this college game improve? Uh, the college game can improve in a, a, a couple of ways. I mean, off the top of my head, the first thing is we got to stop playing in February. We do it. We're guilty of it. We've had four games. We're about to play our fifth game, and we're not even out of, we're not in March yet. It's not good for injuries. It's not good for the fans. It's not good for practice. Um, it creates disadvantages. Um, it's not good. There's nothing good about it. And I'd like to not do it, but I just, we're going to need everybody to do that for us to be able to do it with scheduling. So that's one. Number two, again, we are guilty as charged. I'd rather the recruiting change. I'd rather go back to recruiting juniors and seniors. I'm an information guy. I'm a coach. I want as much information on my opponents as I can get. If we have 10 tapes or 10 whatevers, I want to watch 10 different games of them. I don't want to just watch one. Well, if I'm recruiting, I'd rather watch a kid for two years than watch him for two months. Then why don't you? We could. And we're going to still miss out on a lot of very good lacrosse players. Just because we're recruiting them as freshmen doesn't mean they're not going to be really good players. I'll look at Shaq Stanwick. We recruited him early in his sophomore year. He's a pretty good player. I knew what the first time I saw him in ninth grade, he was going to be a great player. We can't afford, maybe we can, you know, maybe we can at the time. We don't have, a, I guess, a sample, a large enough sample size to say it's a bad thing, but we probably don't have enough sample size yet to say it's a good thing. I just worry that we're going to pass on kids that are going to say, hey, Paul Carcatera is really interested in Johns Hopkins. And I'm going to say, well, thanks, but we don't recruit freshmen. And he's going to go to A, B, C, or D, all of which we play. And then we're going to turn around and we're going to play against 10, 12, or 15 of those guys. Tough scenario. It's a tough scenario. It would be great if the landscape were all even and we all said you know what let's just wait i'd like maybe more than anything maybe more so than the talent evaluation i'd like to get a young man know a young man and get to know his work ethic and his character more ninth grade i i got two 11 year olds i got twin 11 year old boys they're in fifth grade three years three years <laughs> mean i can't get them to take their underwear from behind the bathroom door uh, but I'm recruiting those guys three years from now. 
I just think it would be better for our sport if we moved back because it would give us time to evaluate them more. It would give them more time to choose colleges for maybe more of the right reasons. You know, we got to look at the, the game itself. You know, we got to look at the shot clock. I've been a, a big no shot clock guy. I'm quickly coming around. You know, we got to look at the face off. Uh, we've been very successful at the face off, and I'm quickly starting to, to think is there another way? Um, and I'm starting to think maybe outside the box more, and I think we have to, to look at those things. The other thing I'd like to do is I'd, I'd like to look at changing our game by moving our season back. I'd like to move it f the championship off Memorial Day weekend. Finish when? I don't know when. I don't know, but I know I would like all teams to play their most important and best lacrosse at the most important time of the year, which is at conference tournament time and NCAA tournament time. And a lot of schools are either participating in finals during their conference tournament or during the NCAA tournament. But we would be playing lacrosse at the best weather. We would get better crowds. Um, it would be better for injuries now that we wouldn't be playing in February. And it certainly, I think, would um, make it better for the student athletes to not have to miss as much class or be in exams and have to be competing for the most important trophies there are, which is conference championship trophies and NCAA championship trophies. You mentioned earlier this year has been different than any other year. The loss of Jeremy Huber. Uh, you drop a couple early season games as well. What gives you the belief that Johns Hopkins could win a national title in 2015? I believe in our staff and I believe in our kids. I believe in our young men. Um, you know, we just aren't consistent enough right now and we have to learn to capitalize on opportunities when they're provided to us and just give our opponent fewer opportunities. So we have a lot of growing still to do as a team, but I believe there's still a lot to work with here. I just, just think this team's got a lot of fight and something different about it. And, and maybe what we're dealing with is showing me that there is something different about this group. Doesn't mean we'll win, but doesn't mean we won't. We'll fight, I can promise you that. It's great spending time with you. Always a Best pleasure. Luck. You're a good man. Thanks. I'm Mike Pellegrino. I'm on Long Seat Media at Johns Hopkins University, and we're going to talk about ground balls today. I was frustrated because I couldn't catch the ball because the pocket was so small. I've gotten so many more friends and I've really opened up to a bunch of different people. 